Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Blanche Taylor Moore? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crimes, then offer my analysis. Blanche Taylor Moore was born in Concord, North Carolina, on February 17, 1933. Her father, Parker, was an ordained Baptist minister and a mill worker. He was addicted to gambling and to alcohol. When Blanche was still a teenager, she met a man named James Napoleon Taylor. They married on May 29, 1952, and had two children over the next seven years. Two years into the marriage, Blanche started working at a Kroger supermarket as a cashier. Within about five years, she was promoted to head cashier. In 1962, about 10 years into her marriage with James, Blanche started having an affair with a store manager at Kroger. His name was Raymond Reed. In September 1966, Blanche's father died. The authorities believed that his cause of death was cardiac arrest triggered by emphysema. In November 1970, Blanche's mother-in-law died. She had a number of medical problems, and no foul play was suspected. On October 2, 1973, Blanche's husband, James, died. His death was thought to be caused by cardiac arrest. After her husband died, Blanche was no longer worried about hiding her relationship with Raymond, but the couple started to have problems anyway. In 1985, Blanche had a short-lived relationship with a regional manager at Kroger. So Raymond was a store manager, but then Blanche had a relationship with somebody higher up in the supermarket. In April of that year, Blanche met a pastor named Dwight Moore. In October, she filed a lawsuit against Kroger, saying that she was harassed by that regional manager who she was having a relationship with. This put Blanche in a tricky situation. She was in a relationship with Dwight, but in her lawsuit, she claimed that she was unable to maintain any meaningful social contact with men. Blanche had to keep her romance with Dwight a secret to protect her lawsuit. In April 1986, Raymond Reed, the store manager at Kroger, who Blanche started seeing before her husband died, was admitted to the hospital. He died on October 7. The physicians thought that his cause of death was Guillain-Barre syndrome, a condition related to immune system failure. In 1987, Kroger settled with Blanche for $275,000, although after attorney fees, she only kept just over $100,000. Blanche no longer had to hide her relationship with Dwight Moore. The couple planned on marrying, but their wedding was delayed because Dwight developed some type of condition with his intestines and required two surgeries. The couple finally married on April 19, 1989, and spent a long weekend in New Jersey for their honeymoon. Like many people who spend a few days in New Jersey, Dwight started vomiting right away. Blanche drove back to North Carolina with Dwight sick in the back seat. On April 28, just nine days after getting married, Dwight went to the hospital. In addition to vomiting, he had pain and numbness in his hands and feet, shortness of breath, and was in terrible pain all over his body. The physicians did not know what was wrong with Dwight, and his condition worsened. A toxicology report indicated that Dwight had arsenic in his system. The level of arsenic was 20 times the lethal dose. Dwight had actually broken a record for this particular hospital. This was the most arsenic they had ever found in a living person. Some believe that Dwight may have had the most arsenic in his body of any living person in history. Dwight survived, although he did sustain permanent damage. The hospital notified the police. When they were interviewing Dwight, he mentioned how Raymond Reed, the former boyfriend of Blanche, died from Guillain-Barre syndrome. The police thought this was curious because that particular syndrome has symptoms that are similar to arsenic poisoning. Investigators decided to exhume not only Raymond Reed, but Blanche's father, her first husband, James Taylor, and James's mother. They found elevated levels of arsenic in all four bodies, but the arsenic only explained two of the deaths. 
Raymond, and James. Blanche may have been responsible for poisoning her father and her mother-in-law with arsenic, but she did not cause their deaths. Other conditions led to their deaths. So it sounds like Blanche was trying to speed things along, but what she did with the arsenic did not actually achieve that goal. The individuals died without any assistance from Blanche. Blanche told the police that Raymond and James were depressed and may have taken the arsenic themselves. On July 18, 1989, Blanche was charged with first-degree murder and assault with a deadly weapon. The trial for the murder of Raymond Reed started in October 1990. On November 14 of that year, Blanche was convicted of murder. She was sentenced to death on January 18, 1991. In light of this outcome, the state stopped pursuing the other charges against Blanche. I guess they figured Blanche could only be executed one time. At the time making this video, Blanche is still alive. At age 90, she is the oldest woman in U.S. history to be on death row. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. When Dwight was in the hospital, his arsenic levels kept going up. It never occurred to anybody at the time that Blanche could be poisoning him as he was in the hospital. She would bring him food all the time. It seems fairly obvious now that Blanche was trying to kill him. But at the time, nobody at the hospital mentioned that Blanche could be responsible. She had them completely convinced that she was a victim too. Amazingly, Dwight survived, but Raymond was not as fortunate. After Blanche became a suspect, the police discovered that she used to bring food to Raymond as well when he was in the hospital. She would bring him milkshakes and banana pudding. She literally killed Raymond in the hospital in front of medical staff as they watched her do it. Item number two, Blanche would frequently prepare meals for people in her community. Many people loved her cooking, including Dwight. Some argued that her cooking was to die for. It appears as though Blanche took that compliment, literally. After the police realized what Blanche was up to, they had to look through the medical records of anyone connected to Blanche who died. But they did not connect her to any additional deaths. Item number three. In May of 1990, several months before Blanche's trial started, her attorney received a mysterious letter, ostensibly from a man named Garvin Thomas. In the letter, Garvin took responsibility for the murders and said he was in love with Blanche. So he killed because of his love for her, but not because he was ordered to do so by her. At first glance, this appears to be good news for Blanche. Somebody else was taking responsibility for the murders, but there were two problems. One, Blanche's handwriting and writing style were very similar to the letter. And two, Garvin died a week before the letter was mailed. Blanche thought that she could escape responsibility with a simplistic and clumsy tactic. Item number four, Blanche's motive was almost certainly money. She convinced Raymond's two sons to give her a third of his assets after he died. Therefore, she received about $45,000 from them. Blanche settled the lawsuit with Kroger and kept just over $100,000. And in the mid-1980s, there were two suspicious fires which financially benefited Blanche. One was in her new house, and one was in a trailer that she owned. She was never accused of arson, but it was certainly a possibility. Blanche said that a man who was in love with her must have set the fires. Item number five. Killers are often thought of as viewing people as objects, but Blanche Moore took this concept one step further. She viewed everything and everyone in her life as an asset, not just an object. When she was having fun with her lovers or they were providing her with money, she was happy to avoid homicidal behavior. When they became inconvenient or unproductive in her estimation, it was poison time. Blanche treated her lovers like they were treasury bonds. It made sense to keep them around for a while, but eventually she had to cash them in. Now moving to my last item, number six. What could be going on with the mental health and personality factors in a case like this? This is just a theory, my opinion. Blanche was described as manipulative, sadistic, flirtatious, and impulsive. She had a pronounced interest in sex and was considered promiscuous. She enjoyed discussing the topic of sex with anyone who would listen. Sometimes she would talk about it along with other topics that appeared incompatible. For example, 
She would discuss Bible verses in one moment and male genitalia in the next. People found her crude, unsophisticated, and vulgar, but her appearance was benign. Therefore, no one thought she was harmful. During court proceedings, a mental health clinician who evaluated Blanche said that she had both narcissistic and histrionic features. I think it's likely that she did, but I don't think that fully explains her behavior. She also appeared to have characteristics of psychopathy, like being calm under pressure, lacking remorse, and frequently committing crimes. Blanche was also sadistic and shockingly brazen. For example, she poisoned Raymond and Dwight when they were in the hospital. Blanche had a power over men. They thought she was stunningly attractive and irresistible. Men felt as though they had a special chemistry with Blanche, which was true in a sense. For instance, there were a lot of heavy metals involved. Blanche was described as a pathological liar. She lied about things that didn't even matter. In addition to her more serious lies, like when she denied committing murder. Now moving to my final thoughts. The appearance of any suspect can go a long way to helping them avoid responsibility, especially if they are considered attractive or peaceful. Blanche did not fit the profile of a killer, which allowed her to operate in plain sight with a fair degree of effectiveness. The case of Blanche Moore can be summarized in this way. Perched in a peculiar position, in her populace, Branch presented as a paradox. She was perceived as both pleasant and profane. Plying her wiles, she procured the passion of potential prey, promptly proceeding to poison them. Her pattern of performance proved highly improbable, but eventually her scheme was published when her poison partner prevailed against all probabilities. Those are my thoughts in the case of Blanche Taylor Moore. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.